Good morning, everyone. It's a great pleasure to be here and uh, contribute to this uh, conference. My, yeah, I, I was listening back. My, my last book is no longer Vitruvius. It's arriving from print today, actually. <laughs> uh, so I, I still haven't seen it, uh, but it will be presented next week. This book on codfish architecture, which is the forerunner of the project Fishing Architecture that has uh, granted me this fantastic opportunity to develop the research on fisheries and buildings. And um, the book launch will be 7th of December here in Porto, by night, past Manuel, if you are up for a night of drinks and books, that's, uh, I would definitely recommend. Uh, but I will jump directly into my hypothesis, and what I will present you is uh, essentially an hypothesis of, of research that will be developing, and some of the Portuguese cases that are uh, in it. And the book that, I've, that is done is essentially on Portuguese fisheries and Portuguese fish species. And it started with this kind of ruins and with this kind of landscapes that we have in Portugal um, of the Cots um, um, mania, I could say, eventually, of the 20th century. And I was always intrigued by the capacity and by these, and by these landscapes to define, um, to define the identity of some areas. And at some moments, a bit loose in my mind, I wrote a, a, a travel proposal uh, to Norway, which I managed to finally do it this year, um, to visit also other facilities to dry cod. This is a Norwegian, uh, it's what a drying, uh, traditional drying cod facility, which is relatively different, as you can see, from the Portuguese kind of system, although here it's only a ruin that was an horizontal one. And this hypothesis of following the fish and through the fish following the architecture would lead me to some hypothesis that through a fish we could uh, uh, relate a certain specific architecture. Another, but then I, from the cods, I expanded a little bit for the sardines, and today I will spoke essentially from cod, but also a little bit for of hake, uh, uh, and you will see the difference. And sardines, it's a, it could also show certain kind of continuities between natural or kind of ecological systems or environmental systems. And one would be the, the beach signing uh, fishing facilities like this one in Furadoro, uh, mostly built in woods and using these uh, sea boats that you see that have a flat bottom. And this, this kind of, of boats would allow for the sardine fisheries to, for the sardine fisheries to settle and to and, and especially especially to launch the the, the first sign from the actually larger but directly from the beach without the need of a harbor without heavy infrastructure to set up uh, a fishing operation and that's why you would have these small settlements directly over the dunes on the on the on the shore and this dramatic architectural effect that this position has of um, connecting the, the fishing settlement to the uh, inland um, distribution network for the fisheries. For the sardines, this dramatically changed for the, for the Portuguese case in the 1930s or beginning of the 20th century, actually, it started to change 1880 to be more precise, but this photo is, would show a very different kind of architecture for the same sardines. So it's the same sardines that are being fished, 
but with different purposes. And this building would be a sardine architecture, extremely different from the wooden uh, shacks that you just saw before. Um, so I started to equate these kind of logics of what, what, what can these uh, what can be these relationships between the built environments, our landscapes, our everyday lives? And at some point I was looking carefully to this uh, picture that has become the book on Portuguese uh, God, uh, that also there is a key element that links these architectures and through which we can do a very different history of architecture. I would say an environmental history of architecture. <coughs> Uh, but also an, an history of architecture that relates more the non-human uh, and, uh, and the human, not an history of architecture based on sociology or on the human activities. So I started to look at this presence of God in the urban landscape and I was extremely impressed by this, the difference of price between these three different gods. One is Norwegian cod, one is the Icelandic cod, even bigger than the Norwegian, that's more expensive, 30 escudos. And then you have the national cod, the Portuguese cod, which was caught in Newfoundland, in the Grand Banks of Newfoundland, which not only is less expensive, but it's a tiny cod. <laughs> Essentially, what we can see in this previous slide, it's the result of overfishing. And you see in the urban landscape overfishing happening. This is the 1960s when the Newfoundland banks were being um, devoured, literally. Uh, so, so I start to kind of try to understand how could I organize this, this research project around different kinds of, of fishes, cod, sardine, tuna, eventually salmon, herring, hake, and it's especially the five different layers through which we can follow the differences between what's happening in land, in the built environment, and what's happening in the sea, and, and through which connections and through which links these two uh, environments are connected. One is, of course, marine ecosystems from uh, where everything would begin. Then there, there is fishing technology and at every change of fishing technology you would have a huge impact on the architecture but also on the marine ecosystem. Food processing, so the way you differentiate the, the treatment of the fish and the way that you consume the fish uh, would have an impact on the fishing technology, on the marine ecosystem, on the architecture. Politics, Eventually, not only the, the not only the definition of um, a sea, um, the law of the seas, but also the I, I will explain better with the with the code how certain kind of politics would have eventually an impact on the marine ecosystems, uh, and finally, last but not least, consumption habits, and and the idea of the project is, of course, not to get stuck in Portuguese uh, fishing practices, but write a, a North Atlantic history of this fish uh, and of these relations, and, and through that we will eventually understand that what we usually call vernacular uh, architectures are not at all vernacular. You, s you find the same vernacular in Portugal and in Gloucester uh, Massachusetts, so probably it's not that vernacular. Um, anyway, um, and then change also the shift from architectural history. And then the everything starts with the fish, and it should start from from the fish itself. That's the that's the point. So follow the fish. Uh, architecture follows fish. This is this kind of obsession because constantly. And, and through the different links, we, are, we have the tendency, or at least I have the tendency, not to look at the fish, but look at the human behavior that generates this kind of architectures. And the first thing that the, the fish likes is 
and to check, as we do, is the temperature and water temperature and the dynamics and constant <coughs> dynamics of the of the water temperature and the definition of the um, of the ecosystems. This is a a beautiful website that I love to follow just to fall asleep. You know, this kind of hypnotizing, <laughs> hypnotizing, extremely beautiful. Uh, uh, and and cods would live in these contact zones of between the very cold uh, Nordic uh, uh, Arctic waters and the and the Gulf Stream and the more moderate um, temperatures, which 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 creates a, a certain region where you need to find the cod. And of course you don't find cod in Portugal. Um, <coughs> the second thing is more uh, geographic and, and especially relates to the, the sea bottom and the, the existence of a very long continental shelf uh, um, facing Newfoundland and um, and, uh, and uh, the other side of the pond. And this would create a very unique ecosystem for the thriving of God, which was explored for many centuries. And, this, and the technologies to explore uh, these, uh, these settlements changed. So from the long distance fisheries of the 16th century, that a boat would uh, uh, moor not very far from, from the shore and process everything from the boat, uh, there were settlements being, uh, being done and there was a, a culture of progressive urbanization of Newfoundland. Uh, and at some, at some point, this is an example of a French, <coughs> French fishing station, a, a seasonal fish, fishing station in the north of Newfoundland, that you start to have a kind of a settlement pattern uh, in the in the in the bays and in the coves of Newfoundland with um, with different uh, facilities to process to assist the boats in the fisheries and to process inland the the fish that was being kept, caught or catch. Fished, fished in, the, in the sea. And this developed in these very specific rooms um, which combine the, the, the anchorage points for the boats, uh, the drying facilities in these fantastic structures flying over the, the rocks in the base uh, of Newfoundland, which have for sure an extraordinary smell. <laughs> this is extremely different in terms of uh, in terms of processing. There is an ecological narrative also, but I'm not going. I will focus more on Portugal to, today, but also on how these fishing stations evolved and how they moved throughout the island uh, in, in Newfoundland. But, but this is extremely different of the fishing operations, of the Portuguese fishing operations of the 1940s and 50s that you see here, some routes that would eventually go to the Fillers Bank in, in, in Greenland, North Greenland, um, to, to, to fish. And this, this is the result of changing uh, of fishing systems, of fishing technology, uh, this is not a cod, this is an alibot, but nonetheless it's the, the same idea of the troll, uh, which is this barrel where the long, a long line is set uh, that, would, that would allow this poor guy to go in this flat bottom boat off the main luger or schooner. It's a, an, a combination of American technology and French technology uh, that really transformed uh, the fisheries in the Great Banks in the 19th century. Another huge transformation that took place in the 19th century were mechanical capstans and, and the capacity to haul the, the, the large uh, signs uh, from trolling 
into, into, into the boats. So these kind of uh, uh, engines that then were uh, also adopted in steamers uh, and in and, and more powerful trawlers that would compete in terms of uh, in terms of fisheries with the with the old uh, schooners or luggers, sail powered and man powered through the through the through the dories, uh, the small flat bottom boats that I was. Um, referencing. So these transformations that were taking place in the in the in the 19th century, they really kicked off, uh, especially after World War One, um, in the 1920s and 30s. All the French fishing fleet was already being uh, transformed into steamers and into trawlers. Here is a 1952. Uh, uh, picture of an uh, extraordinary campaign by Anita Conti, an oceanographer, a uh, French oceanographer, of la even larger boats. You see how much larger this boat is in comparison to the before World War I uh, steam uh, trawlers. And this would have a, a huge impact on the systems of transformation of, uh, of the gods. Strangely, this is a 1953. Actually, Anita Conti in, the, in her logbook of the, of the travels, she said, oh, we just saw some Portuguese fishermen passing by. These guys are crazy. They still fish as we used to fish 50 years ago. It's exactly the same uh, year. Um, well, the, the year after the campaign after. And and the, and the thing, you know, that the, the cod is still fished to be processed on board, half processed and then salted, and then dried inland. And then it's the relationship between the salt and the drying that generates those landscapes that I explained you in the very beginning. And at that moment, the big operation that was taking place in Newfoundland that eventually led to the depletion of the of the cod populations of, of the Great Banks w was the incorporation within the um, within the fishing boats of uh, freezing facilities and and the change from dry salted and dried cod into frozen cod which was a change that started to happen in the after during and after the First World War but really took a big uh, power in the seconds uh, after the Second World War. In Newfoundland that had an extraordinary impact, architectural impact, which meant that instead of having multiple small fish stations and small operations with small boats, to have huge boats um, uh, providing uh, large amounts of fish to factories and to concentrated factories. Um, there is also there are also several political agendas that uh, rely on that explain the, that operation. But what happened in the 1950s, late 50s, and during the 60s was a concentration was a concentration of these dispersed uh, settlements throughout Newfoundland into main cities and into larger. Uh, fish processing facilities. So they were simply taking the houses off uh, in rafts through the sea, through the coast, and concentrating them. This is a house moving away. There is an extraordinary film that I'm not showing you today. But the key transformation point of that, uh, of that aspect is the refrigerator and the house refrigerator. And I, I really like to show this Philips picture. It's a Portuguese, um, it's a Portuguese advertisement photograph, because except for this strange piece of meat that we have here, they even put cornflakes into the <laughs> canned pineapples, uh, canned uh, olives, easy dog sausages. It's it's a bit awkward. But one of the things that was the 
of course, milk was one of the reasons for the development of refrigeration systems in the late 19th century. But the big, big input for the domestic refrigerator were electric companies uh, during the 1930s and 40s, um, especially after the electrification policies in the US, uh, to guarantee, a little bit like Netflix, to guarantee that every house is consuming energy 24 hours a day. That's the idea of the refrigerator. It's not to preserve food, it's to have a, a permanent consumer. Um, of course, it's good for fish, and of course, it definitely propelled uh, um, uh, fish consumption and uh, frozen fish uh, networks, which was the uh, the, the, the big developer of the second half of the 20th century. To keep within time, one of the results was the depletion of the fish stocks that you saw in that photograph of Lisbon, mm -hmm. of the small tiny cods being salted and sold slightly cheaper than the clever Norwegian and Icelandic cod, and, uh, and the decay and the ruin of all the Portuguese uh, politics for the cod fisheries, which was a very active uh, uh, and extremely politicized um, um, uh, campaign. And one of the things that I started to realize, and this is a urban, um, a urban um, evolution scheme of Ilevu. Ilevu is one of the main uh, fishing harbors uh, for cod, for dried cod uh, in, in Portugal. And, and you see how many drying facilities existed in 1925, how many existed in 1942, and how many existed in 1956. So it's literally a business that is growing in the 20th century. The same that used the, the dories and the end line uh, and the small boats that I showed you in the previous picture. Um, oops, the other direction. And of course, it was a highly politicized, connotated uh, strategy of fishing and the fishermen as the brave uh, sailor that. Uh, uh, how can you say, that uh, is made the cast of the Portuguese sailors. So you have, this is 1965, uh, um, and this is the guy behind everything, Enrique Kenteig, one of these good old days fascists. Um, this is a priest born in Ilevu, actually the Archbishop of Lisbon, but you see the sailing fleet that is being placed in the Tejo, in front of Lisbon, but not in any place. It's close to Blind, close to Geronimus. You have all this mythology of the Renaissance of Portuguese in the maritime discoveries. And more important than anything else, everything is being televised, monitorized, and mediatized. It's a, it's a media campaign, essentially, to, to boost the... the, the to boost an argument that is, to my horror, I must say, it's extremely cherished by the contemporary tourism industry. And that also had an impact in terms of urban design and in terms of urban monuments. And here you see uh, a refrigerator built in between 37 and 39 in Massarel, which very just go down the street and it's still there. Now it's a fancy housing uh, um, uh, apartment building. But the key is that this architecture was literally monumentalized to make uh, physically visible through the city all these narratives and all these uh, arguments. And you, of course you see, you would see it in every state uh, Portuguese building of the 30s, this uh, and all the rhetorics of the Portuguese regime. But what I wanted to stress, I forgot to put uh, the, the, the image 
of a more or less contemporary Norwegian refrigerator that in terms of architecture, in terms of what, not in terms of the language of architecture, but in terms of how the building is built, it's exactly the same. But, so there is a rhetoric that comes along uh, in the architecture that it's embodied in the fisheries. So what I'm trying to do and starting to do, and what I will show you now, it's a bit still on the, this is already in the publication, the other drawings are still, we are still working on them. Look, take Lisbon, for instance, the, 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 the refrigerator was here, the, the Grenu, there is an assistance uh, warehouse, an important position also uh, on that side, and a lot of drying facilities in the southern part of Lisbon. So this is Apuxete, Bagairo, Seixal, Moita. This one is still functioning today, and it's one of the main uh, producers of uh, dried cod today. Actually, it's, 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 a, it's a crazy thing. They, the cod is taken in Norway, it's frozen, just to make sure nothing happens. It's chipped into here. Then it's unfrozen, treated, salted. After being salted, it's dried for a few months. And after being dried, it's soaked. Uh, and then it's frozen again. And it's, it's, so, so it's, it gets absurd, it's a bit like the refrigerator, the amount of times. And ask why? Because consumers want the taste of the salted dried cod. So it's kind of you know, absurd, it is, I think. But I like cod. And sometimes, sometimes I buy uh, these. <laughs> these. It's a bit more expensive, of course, but anyway. Um, what I'm trying to do, it's not that criticism or looking at to that craziness, but doing some more simple mathematics. And you know architects are not brilliant in mathematics. So we, we took this Perseria Geral das Pescarias, it's a very important, in many aspects, uh, drying facility that's still there in, in Lisbon. We isolated it and, and looked into it in relation to the Lisbon urban network. I, I found, I think I, I took off that slide, but it fits perfect. We could do a, an amazing drying facility in Terreiro do Passo. It would be, a, it would be a great outcome. But making some accountants, making some average of the fish weight that is being caught and of the daily consumption in the 1960s Lisbon, we realized that the annual production of this drying facility would fit this neighborhood uh, of, uh, of Lisbon in terms of calculation of population, uh, average production, etc. This is a 2000s urban Lisbon, so it, it's not uh, 1950s Lisbon, it's a bit a different city. Um, so it's still on the, on the making. And trying to relate what is this architecture meaning in terms of production, in terms of uh, feeding system, but also in terms of, uh, in terms of um, relationship with the urban uh, context. But the thing that is more complicated, <coughs> still fighting to do, and that's what we are trying to do now, is to relate this, this, and the other side. This is a map of the seasonal distribution of cod eggs around uh, Iceland. Uh, it has nothing to do with any particular, um, with any particular uh, architecture, to my notice so far. Um, but, but trying to understand what are the geographical the, and the ecological relations between the architecture that we are working with and the ecosystems in uh, in land. So this map I still haven't not. Maybe you have to write Tavares and someone else 2023 or 24 if we manage. So what happened um, with all these stories and, and, and uh, to come to a certain conclusion um, 
and especially for the story of the cod, um, of the cod fisheries in Portugal, is that literally uh, in the in the late seventies it has become clear that the or in the early seventies after yeah. seventy two the law of the seas would kind of kick many people out of um, many fishing grounds and and the and the ecosystems were changing and the, these sweet families of gods were vanishing from uh, from the great banks of Newfoundland. Uh, in 1992 finally Canada banned the fisheries of cod, so no more cod fish uh, being fished and to their surprise cod never really came back. So they fished not all the cod but almost all the cod. Um, and this was visible in the 1960s and 70s it was already clear that would go into that would be going to happen. So the solution was of course the refrigerators and, and other, uh, other fish species. And from the mid-50s there was a campaign in Portugal um, to create and, and to be part of a modernized <coughs> and to find alternatives to the cod fisheries and the refrigerators for the solution. But more than the refrigerators was uh, the, the network of um, the network of fish distribution. Uh, and, and more than thinking of a large monumental system as it was the cuts uh, with, the, with the drying facilities being concentrated both around Lisbon and Ilhavu or the, these monuments that I showed you within the city, the strategy was to diffuse uh, and to work with um, um, itinerant distribution points for the, for the we could say take, uh, but other uh, fish species that I will uh, uh, soon speak to you about. So they bought hundreds of these beautiful vans. There was also, from the 1950s, a program that I think it was the, the trigger for the government to think it, uh, launched by Gulbenkian, which were the itinerant libraries um, that uh, you might remember. I, yeah. uh, and so these, these beautiful trucks, they could distribute culture and food. Um, but also other kind of facilities, other kind of fisheries were needed uh, to react. <coughs> and another uh, powerful building uh, designed by, by Paulo Cunha in Lisbon, Pedrosos, near, near the line actually, was this, um, this fish market hall uh, um, inaugurated in '66 where the trade of the trawling uh, system of the trawling fisheries was being uh, conducted and it would distribute from that centralized point within the vents throughout Lisbon especially it never really took off for the entire Portugal but I, I wanted to focus not on that side not on that architectural side but on the works that were being done on the coast of Senegal, that you can actually see here more in detail, some surveys already in the 1950s to check what would be the areas where the trawling would be more uh, effective and which kinds of fish would be uh, brought into the nets on those areas. And they realized that Pargo, Pombo, Garopa, and Curvina, that I don't dare to translate by memory their names, um, were the fish species more caught. And that uh, will bring us to the conclusion. So, yeah, this is the, it's, it's not the Citroën van, it's a whole lot, it's another system, but an itinerant fish shop with the kids and the mothers buying Appley fish, new fish. Uh, 
and a fish that is not part of the usual consumer culture. So it's a new fish that is being uh, distributed throughout the city. So to complete, I will just show you um, a small film and then we can engage in conversations. I'll be, I'll be more happy to share some other topics and ideas that uh, wouldn't fit in this lecture, otherwise I'll be speaking endlessly. Um, but what I, this is a TV commercial of the 1960s that, um, that brings these new fish species into public knowledge. But what I'm really impressed at is distribution networks that we, we saw here, and you, you can actually see that they are, uh, they are catering for a larger region that is not the downtown areas of the city. Uh, so there is a new geography that is showing up and with the urban expansion that was happening also in the 60s and 70s. But that goes on still with uh, um, a local scenario. <laughs> Thank you. And